um, a revolution in the sharing economy. And um, uh, Paul Farley Brentebroten is working in Bitspace, and Bitspace is a Norwegian company, a rather new company, working with cryptocurrencies and crypto finance. And uh, the people there have great visions for what they can do with this uh, new technology. And now we're going to hear about some of those uh, visions and plans. So Paul, I give you the word. Thank you for the introduction, Thomas. Um, yeah, I will um, have a talk on uh, the sharing economy and how we can improve it with uh, new technologies, distributed uh, ledger technologies in particular. Just wonder, has, are you all familiar with the concept of the sharing economy? Have you used any kind of services, perhaps Uber, Airbnb? Yeah? So, um, the idea of the sharing economy, um, uh, at least um, what the internet says is that the idea was that millennials, they wanted, you know, um, to not own things. They instead want to have things on demand so they can just use it uh, whenever they want to use it. And I see uh, some trends uh, that I think is kind of inspired by the nomadic uh, way of living. Uh, you have uh, organizations like Remote Year where you will live like a digital nomad and travel from city to city. Uh, you won't have much things with you and you'll just um, live on demand, actually. And um, so that's what we want, really. We want to have the on-demand economy, but I wouldn't call it sharing economy. Um, my definition of sharing is that when someone gives something to another person uh, for free. Uh, if that person pays for that thing, then you have a transaction and you have a trade. And if you put sharing and trade, they cancel each other out. It's contradictory. So um, the point is that <coughs> I think um, that uh, we, the sharing economy should rebrand, be rebranded to the on-demand uh, economy. And I will give you an example of uh, what the sharing economy is actually doing today. What is it all about? So uh, I'll give you an example. And if you take a carpooling service, for instance, right? Uh, so what happens is that you, uh, the carpooling service, it um, uh, transacts with two groups of people. So the first people, they have a need, right? So they need, uh, they are in need of a ride. They need to go somewhere. So what they do, they, they request this carpooling service. Uh, can someone come and pick me up and take me to this place? And the other group of people, they also have a need. They are the drivers, right? And they need customers and they have free space. Uh, so they are also requesting to this carpooling service, do you have any customers that I can pick up and drive somewhere so I can earn more money? So what um, the carpooling service actually does, it's creating a match. And it's using an algorithm to match one person from each group and uh, a carpooling service like Uber usually it takes a 30% cut of that. Uh, and this is a pattern you will see in all the sharing economies. It's the same thing with Airbnb. They, have, they are matching you know, people that need to rent a place with people that have a uh, place for rent out available. So it's an on-demand service, really. It's not sharing. So basically, the sharing or the on-demand economy is doing, it's monetizing you. Um, because they are not owning anything. They are not, Airbnb doesn't own any hotels and Uber doesn't, you know, um, own any cars. It's, it's, uh, and they are running off 
things that you own. So they are built upon uh, your car, your house, your apartment, your emotion, and most importantly, importantly your time. Um, you know, um, com uh, <coughs> companies like Upwork, they match uh, people that has a task they need to be done, and they match that with people that can complete these tasks. So they, uh, the workers there, they offer their time. So, um, you know, this new on-demand economy, it's very convenient. Um, I'm sh sure it's, you know, Ubers are cheaper than taxis. Uh, Airbnb is usually cheaper than the hotels. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, a shame really that it's not that very good for the workers in that economy. Because the workers in Uber, for instance, they don't have any, you know, welfare model. They don't have any particular rights that you get from um, a full employment contract. Uh, so they lack all of these kind of things. Uh, and I think some of these companies were born in Silicon Valley and they, um, they are probably a good fit in USA, but I think that in the Scandinavia where we have a strong traditional welfare models, social rights and such, uh, it's not a very good fit when a company comes and just takes all the social rights away. So I think that we need to think differently about these uh, organizations and perhaps rebuild them to match our kind of society. So how do we do that? Uh, some of you might be familiar with the cooperative economy. In Norway we have, um, I can mention, two big companies that are kind of mixing uh, capitalism and cooperativism. We have an insurance company called Gensidia, which pays some of its uh, revenues back to its customers. And we also have a, a grocery store chain that is called Coop which has the same model. So it's, it's more traditional in Scandinavia with uh, these kind of models. <laughs> so um, what's the thing about cooperative models then? Um, so you have more incentives uh, when you work in a cooperative mo model because you're a stakeholder and, and perhaps you have shares or you, you get uh, some value back for your efforts. Um, and instead of, you know, profits just going straight back to the shareholders in cooperatives, profits can be turned into benefits, like a welfare model. Um, and this means that even in the gig economy, where you have just freelance works, and which traditionally is not really uh, having any welfare systems, you can have uh, welfare for the gig economy if you have a cooperative model. Uh, and what's common for these kind of models is that you have a flat organization, uh, perhaps reputation systems, um, and you reward contributions to the uh, cooperative network. But there are, of course, uh, some drawbacks. Um, because cooperatives, they will have to, you know, compete for the same resources as, uh, as the private models or the private companies. They will have to compete for the best employees, the best designers, and so on. And they are, they are playing the same game, the same capitalist game. The, the cooperatives, they have to make money, they have to compete, uh, and corporations, they uh, they can perceive uh, a cooperative as a threat and they will uh, try to uh, wage price wars or enact lobby for legislation that is um, not beneficial for the cooperative and so on. So it's, it's, uh, the point is, is that it could be hard to bootstrap the cooperative and to scale it. But what if you could do this? Uh, what if you could have our own version of Facebook or Netflix? 
And um, what if the drivers of Uber, uh, the 30% that Uber takes, uh, instead of that going to Uber, what if that was going to, um, you know, welfare for the drivers, right? Could this be built? And I think that is possible now um, with the new kind of technology called distributed ledger technology. Is everyone here familiar with distributed ledger technology? Have you heard of blockchain? Some of you have, yeah? Uh, I'm not going to go to, into very technical things of what a blockchain is. Um, but basically what uh, these systems um, are is that it's, uh, it's an open and transparent system and it's, it's basically an order book. It's a ledger, right? And anyone will, with access to the ledger can read all the transactions um, and all the transactions are immutable. So you cannot go back and change a transaction that happened. Um, also, it's decentralized, so it's all over the world, right? Uh, it doesn't have a central point of failure or uh, it's, it's very hard to attack because you have to attack the whole network simultaneously. And it's censorship resistant due to that fact. So I want to give you a couple of examples of um, new business models that are built with this new kind of, kind of technology. But since they are so different and unique, um, people often um, don't understand things like, okay, so where does the money come from? Uh, because it, this, these systems, they don't work like the traditional business model where you have uh, profits and expenses. It doesn't work like that. Um, it, uh, it's, um, for starters, a cryptocurrency is a currency. So it's like a central bank. You can print money, which is <coughs> um, pretty new. And if I'm going to um, give you an example based on Bitcoin. Uh, so Bitcoin has 21 million Bitcoins. That's the total number of Bitcoins that will ever exist. And today there has been printed about 16 million Bitcoins. So that means that every 10, 10 minutes there will be printed new Bitcoins. And what happens with these new Bitcoins? Where those do they go? So they go to the miners. And the miners are um, people that use their computer uh, or CPU power to secure the network. So Bitcoin has decided that we want to reward the people that keeps the network secure. But it doesn't have to be that for all cryptocurrencies. You could take this new printed money and distribute it in any way you want. For instance, you could have uh, all the new, say that all the new money will be uh, going into a trust fund for welfare for the workers that participate in the network, for instance. So that's one way where new money comes into the system. The second is by design. And there's uh, quite a few projects where the developers and the founders, they set aside a small portion of the total number of tokens in the, in the currency. And they put this into maybe a foundation, a non-profit foundation. Um, and the funds will be used you know, to sustain the platform, develop the platform, or bootstrap the network. Um, which is what cooperatives kind of struggle with uh, today. Uh, they tend to run for raising money all the time. But um, so you could have have it in a you know foundation um, consisting of the developers or the founders. Some have made it uh, a foundation with, uh, based on a democratic model where stakeholders can vote what the funds are going to be used to, and some have just 
put, built it into smart contracts where the foundation is totally autonomous. So that is two ways you can generate new uh, money in the network. And now I'm going to <coughs> show you one example of how, how this works. Um, and I'm going to start with Steemit. Steemit is a blogging platform um, or a social media platform. It kind of looks a lot like Reddit, for those of you who have heard of that. Uh, Reddit was the big inspiration for Steemit. Uh, and it's been up and running since summer 2016, has over 100,000 users, and it paid uh, uh, about $2 million to its users, I think. Um, so, if you have two persons and you have the Steemit network in the middle, so what happens is that some person, they share valuable content on the network, they, they brought the blog on the Steemit platform. And then other users, they will read um, the blog and they will decide that, wow, I like this blog. So here's my vote, I will vote. And the voting system is actually uh, a validation system that uh, says that this blog is valuable content. So they are approving uh, that the content is valuable. And what, happened, what happens then is that Steemit says, okay, I will give rewards. First, I will pay the community member for sharing the blog post. And I will also pay the community member that approved the content as a thank for validating that the content is valuable. So here you have uh, actually a sharing economy example where uh, both sides get rewarded with tokens. I'll give you another example. Um, Pandora is a marketplace for artificial intelligence uh, net, um, developers. And so you, you have three actors. Uh, you can either you know, share your processing power. If you have some spare CPO power, you can sell that to the network. If you are sitting on big data sets, you can, well, you can share that to the network and you can sell it on the platform. Or if you have an AI algorithm, um, you can sell that as well. So all these three people uh, can generate revenue uh, <coughs> based on what they offer to the platform. But on the other side here, you will have developers that can take all these, uh, you know, uh, big data processing power and AI algorithms, and they can start build uh, AI apps, they can test their machine learning models, or they can train their um, AIs on different data sets. And what Pandora tries to do is to democratize um, big data so that um, it's not just big tech companies that sits on these huge vast pools of data anymore. So you can, um, you can uh, access big data for your AI projects, which will probably also help uh, with bias in the data because you can get a div diverse, uh, you can get diverse sets of data. And practical VR, is, yeah, it's, it's another platform where um, basically the user will find tokens with augmented reality. Uh, so you will wear this uh, Microsoft HoloLens, for instance, and just like Pokemon Go, you will see that tokens start popping up into the room. So, 
So you will, you will you know, go and catch these tokens. And as you navigate, if I walk up the stairs, for instance, the HoloLens will automatically map these stairs as I go up to the token. So the token is kind of like a carrot to guide the user around so that he can map the surroundings. And of course, you know, these maps are useful to developers that want to build uh, augmented reality or virtual reality platforms. If I were to um, have an augmented reality based on this room, and I was to throw a ball that in that direction, the ball would just fly through the wall. But when you have it mapped, you could have it bounce back uh, because uh, the computer would understand its surroundings. So, yeah, and this actually works. This is from a conference we had earlier. This is not science fiction, that's a token. He was demonstrating it live on stage. So what we have is incentivizing sharing. We incentivize sharing to, uh, or people to share instead of just monetizing sharing. Um, and you can incentivize people to do validation, to do development, to do design. Some have set up bounty systems to fix security issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, who decides um, what happens in these cryptocurrencies? What's the governance like? So. There is different kinds of governance models. Um, some more centralized than others. Um, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they are not entirely centralized. Um, there are more stakeholders than just the developers, um, such as the miners, for instance. Um, but um, there is, for instance, two developers in Ethereum that does most of the commits, so obviously they have a lot to work uh, or have a lot to say in, uh, in what happens. Um, there are community-driven governance where there's a government model called proof of stake, which means that the more tokens you have of a currency um, decides how much you have to say. So the more tokens you have, the bigger the stake you have because you are more invested into the network. And thus you get more votes, voting power, uh, and it works that in a very democratic way that token holders will vote on how the community should evolve. Um, and then you have, lastly, autonomous decentralized governance where um, algorithms have been made in advance and will, um, it, there's no humans governing at all. Um, and the algorithm can, is usually able to you know, um, decide if it needs software upgrades, it will you know, create some smart contracts and hire some developers, uh, so it kind of lives its own life. So, with cryptocurrencies and cooperatives, you could have a cooperative point two, two point oh, uh, and you would have governance with with stakes and voting in a democratic uh, democratic way. You can reward. Um, you can reward individual people that create value on your network uh, or work done on a network. Uh, and there is um, censorship resistant. You can, it's, it's very uh, hard to corrupt uh, such a system. Uh, and of course, it's open and totally transparent for everyone. So, um, I believe that we are transitioning into 
um, a world of abundance from a world of scarcity. And this kind of requires new government uh, models. Uh, and I, I'm not sure where I heard this the first time, but someone said that you have a masculine archetype governance model and a feminine archetype governance model. And the masculine governance type is uh, especially good in a scarcity setting because you have top-down governance, uh, command and control, uh, it's based on the <coughs> scarcity principles uh, and rewards hoarding, you know. And um, what we should transition to and what is possible with these distributed ledger technologies is the feminine architecture where you will have more flat governance, where you will have collaboration and an abundance and sharing as, as the primary values. And uh, yeah. So an example of a designer cooperative, a um, couple of years ago, I actually tried to start one myself. Um, that was before I heard about the blockchain, and when I did, I left and I <coughs> joined Bitspace. Uh, but let's say that Siri, she creates a new logo for a project she's working on, and she posts this on the platform, and the stakeholders in the project or the network, they was to approve it or not, they can give feedback, and eventually as the logo is approved, Siri is rewarded with their tokens, and the logo is then added to the cooperative's portfolio to attract new customers. So this could also be a new way of organizing work. Oops. But there are hurdles ahead. And to simply just start a cryptocurrency, you will soon find, find that you will run into regulatory issues. Um, and uh, the user experience of this system are still pretty bad. Uh, it's not very user-friendly and not very uh, consumer-friendly either. Um, there is um, also the problem if, okay, so if everyone has their own unique token and you have 6,000 tokens, how are you going to, um, how are you going to keep track of all of that, you know? Uh, so, so you need some kind of system that's, um, some easy way of exchanging tokens uh, and, and to connect uh, these cryptocurrencies easily back into the, to the traditional world of uh, uh, fiat currencies. So I'm going to talk a little bit in the end about what's, what's on the horizon. Um, was coming to the distributed ledger technologies. And there's a project called EOS. Uh, it's still in development, but uh, when EOS is finally out, that will be a tool for you to build your own blockchains. And it will be like an operating system uh, for blockchains, which means that uh, instead of building everything from scratch, you can just use templates. Let's say you need a wallet service, you will just pick the services you want, and you don't have to worry about all building new cryptographic systems and such. So that will be all taken care of for you, which will hopefully uh, make this a lit lot easier to work with. So the uh, vision is that a JavaScript developer can simply start his own blockchain just using regular JavaScript, which is powerful. Um, it's also uh, possible with EOS to do cross-chain transactions. So if you have 500 uh, blockchains on EOS, they can all transact with each, uh, each other, which kind of solves this multiple token uh, problem that I briefly mentioned. Um, another one is Nexus. It's a um, third generation blockchain. 
and it's going to launch into space next year. Uh, into um, it will be deployed on low orbit satellite network. Um, they have a contract with. Uh, I can't remember the company, but it's the, one of the SpaceX founders. He left off and started his own company uh, to democratize uh, software in space, uh, which means you can basically um, do transactions uh, without internet if you have a satellite dish or if you are anywhere near uh, a base uh, station, uh, kind of like the GSM network. And finally, you have um, IOTA, which is um, blockchain without the blockchain. Um, it's uh, built for the machine-to-machine -machine economy, and it offers free transactions. So um, you can um, have uh, machines transact transacting uh, with each other uh, without having to. Uh, yeah, so, so it, it cancels out the mining part, so you can have uh, machines communicate efficiently, or you could, you know, uh, do cross-border payments. So you could, you know, send value from Norway to wherever for free. Um, it also gets faster the more. Uh, people using it. So in theory, it has unlimited scaling. Uh, in contrast, Bitcoin has three transactions per section, which is not scalable. And um, it also uh, is very efficient because it's designed to run on these devices that not necessarily has a lot of storage, memory, or bandwidth. Um, so that's uh, I think that we will see better and better tools to um, build new stuff on this, these uh, systems. Uh, and if anyone is going to make a cooperative on these systems, please let me know because I'd really like to see that happen. Um, also, I would like to give credits to Trevor Skulls and his book on platform cooperativism. That was kind of a little bit of the inspiration for this talk. And with that, I'm open for questions, if there's anyone. Sorry. Any questions? No. Could you please elaborate on the incubator role at Bitspace? The a bit space. Yeah. Yeah. The incubator side of that. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we want to be an incubator and create new blockchain uh, projects uh, or new projects based on cryptocurrencies or blockchain or distributed ledger technologies. Uh, and our first project is Bitgate, which is um, uh, a marketplace where you can buy cryptocurrencies. Uh, in a safe and unregulated way. And we start with that because one of the problems with uh, cryptocurrencies today is adoption. It's hard to, um, to get hold of these tokens. You must, like, if you want IOTA, you probably have to go to some um, foreign <coughs> exchange where you will have to upload your passport and lots of... Uh, <laughs> It will take maybe a couple, uh, week before you get verified, and it's, it's, it's really hassle to get hold of these tokens. Um, so we, we think that before we can build anything that's useful, uh, that we have to address that issue first. Um, and um, after that, uh, who knows? Did that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, hi. I am uh, new to crypto concepts. So yeah. I was just wondering, is crypto is accepted around the whole world or it's only for certain countries? Yeah. Um, we could use. Is so, 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 uh, is can the you crypto currency concept is accepted around the world in all the countries or it's only for certain countries? Okay, yeah. Um, 
So it's uh, to, it's, it's um, despite the difficulties of getting hold of it, it has actually a um, very low barrier of entry. Um, all you need is uh, a device that has internet, and then you can start participating. So that means that you could have, uh, there's actually a company in Kenya that has um, tried to set up a payment service with Bitcoin. Uh, it's called BitPesa. So this technology is, uh, right now it's restricted to areas where you have internet, but anyone can participate. And one of the, one of the you know, selling points for cryptocurrencies is that it can help you know, the two billion people in the world that doesn't have bank, accept, uh, bank access or that doesn't have uh, or are left out of the financial system. They can you know, start, this could be their entry point because they don't have to set up a bank account. They can just uh, create a wallet address and then they will be uh, participate. So that is one of the strength of decentralized systems. It's supposed to be global uh, and for everyone. And there is no government controlling it or anything. It's totally decentralized and running by algorithms. Did that answer? Yeah. Yeah, hi. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't have much a question. I just wanted to mention for everyone that is interested in more about this cooperative uh, sharing economy stuff, I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. And as you said, uh, for uh, like uh, all these things that we have talked about today with climate change and resources and to cut that down. So it's uh, this website called uh, shareable.net. Mm. They talk a lot about this and I just wanted to mention it for, uh, for everyone interested in more about this and maybe you should, uh, if you don't have a contact there already, you should uh, talk to them, maybe write something there. Yeah. My, yeah, contact. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, my contact information. Uh, just feel free to send me any email or contact me or you can come and talk to me later. Uh, I'll be sticking around for a little while. Um, thank you for having me.